Hey, this is Patrick. Let's dive into Test 65's comparative reading passage about blackmail. We're going to try a methodology here where we read one passage and then we go work on some questions. Having only read that first passage, then we read the other one, relate them to each other, and finish off the questions. So how do I pick which one I want to read first? Well, I'm looking at the questions. Some questions are just about passage A, some are just about passage B. Some are asking us, which is true in each of these? And then some of them are asking, you know, what's the relationship between the two? If a question's asking just about A or just about B, then if we've read that passage, we can go ahead and pick our answer. We don't need to read the other one. If a question's asking which of these answer choices is supportable from each passage on its own, then we can eliminate anything that doesn't work for the passage that we have read. Sometimes that gets you all the way to a correct answer, but usually it just knocks out two or three where it's pulling from the other passage and it sounds like an alien language to you. If the question is testing the relationship between them, we wouldn't touch it yet. We gotta wait till we've read both passages. Pause and think for yourself, is this testing me on just A, just B, each of them separately, or the relationship between them? The first one is about each passage. The second one's just about A. The third one's a little ambiguous. It's asking what's supported not by each passage, but by the information given in the passages. So they might mean that you need both of them together to answer it. So I don't know, maybe each. The fourth one has both A and B, which I pretty much assume is a relationship one. I'll save that for later. The fifth one's also ambiguous. It's asking what can be inferred from the passages. And so again, they might mean collectively. I can't tell if that's something that I could eliminate based on having only read one of them. So maybe that's based on what each passage says, I can't tell. And then the last one starts with the word relationship, so clearly that one's testing a relationship. So for this set, we would start by reading passage A, because it's the only one where a question was asking specifically about passage A. So if we read only passage A, we would know that we can pick our answer on the second question, we can definitely make some eliminations on the first one, and we can take a peek at the answer choices for the third and the fifth and see whether it feels possible to make eliminations. So let's go read passage A. These two passages start with a blurb. That's pretty uncommon. It doesn't seem like it is really telling us anything important. It's just saying both of these articles are from law review journals. Cool. Go ahead and pause the video if you want to read passage A. All right, welcome back. When we're breaking down a first paragraph, we're trying to think about what is the topic, what kind of framework would make sense to organize my big picture ideas, and do I see the author? Do I see any pivot language? The topic is usually revealed in the first sentence, so take your time until you are really warmed up. The frameworks that we use are these seven, especially the top five. And then the pivot language that you look out for are things like but, however, yet, recently. In this passage, the first sentence lets us know that we're talking about blackmail within Canada and the United States, and we're basically talking about, you know, why it ought to be illegal. So are there any clues in there? It does say it's unique, which sounds like highlighting something noteworthy, but it says that no one can explain why it's illegal. So that actually sounds like explain a puzzling situation, or maybe you might think, well, it's a problem that we got to solve. Somebody's got to figure out how to explain why it's illegal. When we see by the end of that paragraph that the author is asking a question, I would settle on, we're trying to explain this puzzling question, answer this riddle. Why is it illegal to combine them? Okay, combine what? What are we talking about? Well, it says there's a paradox. It uses the pivot word we associate with paradoxes, but yet, however. So what is the paradox? Well, it's saying you have two separate acts that are legal. Free speech says that you're allowed to reveal somebody's embarrassing secret. And you're also allowed to like ask them for 40 bucks to mow their lawn. But when you combine those two things, it becomes blackmail, asking them for money in relation to revealing an embarrassing secret. Once we start feeling like we have our big picture framework, then we kind of make some mental space. I'm trying to keep track of this puzzling question and how the author will explain it. So again, the author is saying, given that these two things are legal, you can ask for money, you can say, an embarrassing truth about someone. Why is it illegal to combine them? We'll now be reading with an appetite for an answer. Why is it illegal to combine them? And the second paragraph is gonna make us wait. 
In fact, it seems to take a different direction. It's talking about the implications of lacking a successful theory rather than sort of like figuring out the successful theory. So now I'm like, okay, should I have been doing problem solution? Because damaging consequences does sound like problem. I could say that my problem is that we don't have a good theory of blackmail. And so it means that we write these statutes in a real fuzzy way. We count on prosecutors not to take them too literally. And so my solution would be, how do we fix that? We need a good theory of blackmail. Either framework could take us to the same finish line, but let's just keep the original one we had going. We think that the author is saying, given that these two actions are separately legal, why is it illegal to combine them? When the third paragraph starts, it's got BAMO, another of those big pivot words, and our author is saying, here comes the answer. It is possible to come up with a good theory for blackmail. So what is the author's answer? Why is blackmail illegal? Well, it starts off a little confusing. I don't really know what she means by the triangular structure or supplementary leverage. But once you start thinking of a specific case, you're thinking, you know, if you were blackmailing your friend Eddie because you knew he had committed adultery and wouldn't want his wife to find out, and you're saying, Eddie, you pay me 40 bucks every month and I won't tell your wife about your affair. I'm not really providing Eddie with any value. His wife would be very angry or upset to find out this news, and he's afraid of that happening. So I'm like hijacking her reaction and treating it as though it's my value. I'm using leverage that doesn't belong to me. And then they give a more familiar example with sort of a criminal idea, like what if Eddie's committing tax fraud and you know he's cooking the books? You're like, Eddie, if you don't give me $100 a month, I'm going to rat you out to the IRS. Once again, Eddie's afraid of the IRS. I'm not really providing him anything. I'm just kind of hijacking the IRS's enforcement capabilities and stealing their value and extracting it from Eddie for myself. Once we've made it through that first pass, if we need to reread the beginning, we should to, to tie together any loose ends. Otherwise, we should kind of restate the big picture. The question was, given that you're protected by free speech to tell the world that Eddie had an affair on his wife, and given that, you know, you're allowed to charge Eddie money for services rendered, why is blackmail illegal? Because the service you're using is really his wife's wrath. You're, <laughs> you're borrowing her leverage for your own benefit. Okay, so we would often drift right into reading passage B, but remember, we're trying something different. We're going to go work on some questions. We'll immediately go to 15, which is the one that was asking only about passage A, because this is the most important one we could do right now. They're saying, what does the phrase the state's chip mean? Go ahead and pause if you want to try it on your own. Welcome back. Before I dive into answers, I'm asking myself, do I need to research this in the passage? I want to be able to predict what the answer is going to say. So do I need to look it up or no? Researching would mean I'm kind of trying to find these keywords. I'm reading around that area, the like window of supporting text. And then I'm going to put that material into my own words, then head to the answers and try to pick pretty decisively. I will do no research if I already feel my brain auto-completing the question stem. If I already know how I would answer the question based on the question stem, I don't really need to look back to the passage. Or sometimes the question stem just doesn't give you any hints about what it's really asking about. It just says, which of these is true? In this case, I feel like I need to go back. I don't quite remember what we meant by the state's chip, so I kind of need to read the context. I know that it's taking me to that second to last sentence, but I don't want to make my support window too narrow. The beginning of that sentence is, for example, and the beginning of the following sentence is thus. So I definitely want to read a sentence before and a sentence after because they're clearly rhetorically connected. We were talking about the idea that when you blackmail someone, you're really threatening harm from someone else. So if I say, Eddie, if you don't pay me 100 bucks a month, I'm going to rat you out to the IRS for committing tax fraud. Eddie is afraid that the IRS will find out and come arrest him. So when it says, I'm bargaining with the state's chip, I mean, in poker metaphor, it's like I'm playing with house money. I'm, I'm using their money to place a bet. But it seems like what it means is, like, I'm using their power, the fear that they create, as my leverage. So if I'm putting this in my own words and I'm trying to complete the question as written, 
the state's chip is referring to a government's power to come arrest you, right? Like power to do you harm, ability to arrest you for tax fraud. I don't, I don't really know exactly how we should say it, but I know that's what we're talking about in that sentence. So I'm going to hold on to that phrasing as a mantra, like, all right, it's referring to the government's potential to harm you or to arrest you, basically, for doing something wrong. A is talking about the government's authority to determine what actions are crimes. Um, yeah, like to come assess whether what Eddie is doing is a crime. I think that works. Let's keep that. Um, the government's interest in learning about crimes. Sure, that sounds kind of like the same thing. Like the government's going to come and see, oh, Eddie's been committing tax fraud. That's what I'm talking about. C I can get rid of. It's not about preventing crimes. And D is way too strong because exclusive reliance on citizens. No one ever said that the government has no other sources of information other than private citizens. And then the last one's talking about forcing somebody to testify in court. That's not what we're threatening at all. We're threatening Eddie with the government coming to arrest him, not to force him to testify in court. If I revisit A and B, is this more about the government determining what actions are crimes or learning about crimes committed? I think I was mistaking what we mean by determine what actions are crimes. I don't think that means to assess Eddie's behavior and determine whether it was criminal. I think A is saying the government has the legislative authority to write laws into the books, you know, outlining what actions are crimes. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about the government showing up at Eddie's house and taking him off to jail for tax fraud. So notice how far that correct answer is from our prephrase. You know, we, we digested the material so that we could get a good meaning going in our gut. We're talking about threatening Eddie with the government coming to arrest him. And the closest match we had for that was legitimate interest in learning about crimes committed in its jurisdiction. So you have to make sure that you really own comprehension of what you're looking for, because the correct answer is a mile away from how it should be written, but it's still the best available answer. Now we're going back to number 14, which was the one question that we knew was testing each passage independently. We know we can make eliminations. If anything doesn't match the passage we read, it has to be wrong. Pause if you want to try eliminating some on your own. Welcome back. Since they're asking us for the central topic, I go into my little mind cave. Do I already have an answer that's holstered for this question stem? Sure. I mean, I know what the central topic of this was. That's one of the first things I figured out. It's blackmail. It's why blackmail is illegal. All right, so I'm going in here looking for something like why blackmail is considered a crime. A is talking about triangular transactions, way too broad. Blackmail happens to be one example of that, but the author is talking about why blackmail is illegal not why all triangular transactions are, which probably is not true. B says that the topic of this passage was the role of the right to free speech in this legal system. What are you, crazy? It was blackmail. I know we talked about free speech, but blackmail had the starring role. C is talking about blackmail. I love you, C. But I don't love you, C. How it's been handled in a given legal system does not sound like why it's a crime. I might keep it just because it's the only one with blackmail so far, but that does not sound appealing. The history of blackmail is a legal concept. Well, again, we got blackmail. I definitely don't like history. There's no discussion of blackmail through time. It's just currently in Canada and the US, so that's got to be wrong. And then E is saying the topic is why there's no good explanation for why blackmail is illegal. But our last paragraph literally offers an explanation, which the author thinks is coherent. She thinks it's good. So we're contradicting E when we get to that last paragraph. Does that mean C is our best answer? Okay, can we go back to A and research our qualms, how it's been handled? The first sentence tells us it's been handled in a unique way because no one can explain why it's illegal. The second paragraph tells us that it's been handled by writing really like vague statutes, way too broad. We're kind of counting on the prosecutors to know what we really mean. So that's how we're handling the lack of a successful, tightly drawn blackmail theory. That doesn't seem like quite the main point to me, but it's the best available answer. There are many uncomfortable moments in reading comp where you are telling yourself, you know what? 
I'm not here to pick the perfect answer. I'm here to pick the best available, because it's frustratingly not as good as an answer we would have written. Now let's go to the debatable ones. When we look at these answers, do we feel like we could make eliminations based on what we've read? Not really. I'm seeing Roman, Roman, Roman. I don't know anything about Roman law. That's clearly the other passage. Let's get out of here. It seems like it's really testing a relationship. What we're looking for is stuff that's testing double support, meaning which answer could you support with each of the passages? This feels more like the totality of both of them. What about number 18? When we look at these answers, does it feel like we could make eliminations about what would not be illegal under Canadian and U.S. law? I don't love it. Maybe, but if I'm in doubt, I'm out of there. It's not worth trying this move unless it feels clear and easy to execute. So now we're heading to read the other passage. When we read the second passage, it's not like a normal, what framework should I use? It's more like, how does it relate to the other one? They're really not consecutive steps. They're simultaneous steps. As you read it, you actively relate them to each other. You start thinking, fundamentally, are they similar or different? Do they have the same topic? Do they have same or different tone? Is one more broad, one more specific? Do they kind of have a similar purpose? Do they rely on any of the same studies or evidence or names? Like, is there any overlapping data they're both looking at? We might want to quickly recap our thinking for Passage A. Given that blackmail is these two separately legal things, free speech, right to seek money, it's illegal to combine them because in doing so with blackmail, you're using someone else's leverage as your benefit, as your value. All right, pause the recording, read Passage B. As soon as the first sentence, we should be asking ourselves questions like, how does this relate? Right away here, we know it relates in topic. They're both about blackmail. It differs in topic because one of them was approaching it from Canadian and U.S. law, and the other one's approaching it from classical Roman law. But there's another thing within that first sentence. In passage A, blackmail was unique. No one could explain it. And in passage B, it's actually kind of boring. They have no special category for it. It's kind of unremarkable. So I don't fully understand what that distinction is, but it is another one that we could capture from just that first sentence. So we learned that in Rome, they basically considered whether or not an action caused harm. Does blackmail cause harm? Well, they were thinking if you were revealing to Eddie's wife that he cheated on her, that would definitely harm Eddie. You know, he would have a lot of shame, his reputation would suffer, his status might suffer. Prima facie, it's unlawful. Prima facie, some Latin term that means like, you know, first and layer, face, first facade. Basically a legal term that means my first impression, the outer layer, looks as though it's unlawful. And they go on to say that the burden of proof would actually be on the blackmailer. They would be like, Patrick, who do you think you are to tell the world that Eddie had an affair? You need to show us positive cause for why you think you've got that privilege to reveal it. Whereas in passage A, it said, the right to free speech protects my right to disclose Eddie's embarrassing secret. In passage B, it's saying, nope, you don't have any right to do that, Patrick. If you are threatening to reveal a shameful secret, you need to show why you're entitled to reveal that information in the first place. So this is the big difference between the two passages, that in the American-Canadian system, normally you would be protected by free speech in publicizing Eddie's affair as long as you weren't doing it for money. If you were just doing it for schadenfreude, you could post on Twitter, man, Eddie sure likes his mistress a lot, <laughs> passive aggressively. But in Rome, you aren't allowed to do that. The fact that you're revealing someone's secret, which could harm them, or even threatening to, which means you're threatening harm, makes it illegal prima facie, a word I just learned. The last paragraph really doesn't add anything. It just keeps reaffirming that just because it's true that Eddie cheated on his wife doesn't mean that you, Patrick, have any right to disclose that. Just because the shameful thing is true doesn't mean it was lawful for you to reveal it. Now that we're done with passage B, if we return to the beginning, we can realize, all right, that's what they meant by had no special category. They didn't have to invent some fancy way to explain it 
They were just saying, hey, don't rat out harmful secrets or don't threaten to rat out harmful secrets. You're not allowed to do harm unless you have some like legitimate purpose that the public authorities care about. So what is the big picture difference? Well, both on blackmail law, obviously two different settings, two different time periods. In one of them, you had these two separate freedoms that couldn't be combined because you're then sort of hijacking a third party's leverage. But in Rome, you were just supposed to keep your mouth shut. Unless you had some good reason to disclose somebody else's secret, you are not allowed to engage in that activity, whether there's money involved or not money involved. All right, so now we're ready to go finish the questions. If we return to question 14, let's pretend we're answering it just from passage B. We would pause after reading the question stem and think, well, what was the central topic of B? And we'd probably say it was how Roman law thought about blackmail. If we go through the answers, we would think triangular transactions sounds like an alien language. We never talked about the right to free speech. In fact, we kind of talked about the opposite. There's no history of blackmail. This one might be tempting because classical Roman law is a historical period. But to say the history of blackmail means like it's ongoing progression at different moments in time. And this is only one moment of time. And in terms of E, there's no discussion of why. There's no good explanation for blackmail. In fact, the very first sentence is saying we didn't even have a special category for it. It wasn't necessary. So interestingly, either passage on its own is actually enough in this case to get the correct answer on 14. Moving on to question 16. Pause the recording if you want to give this one a try. We deferred on 16 because the answer seemed a little bit too relational. So the question stem doesn't give us any way to anticipate the answer. It's just super generic, so we dive right in. The one thing you might do is remind yourself that the trap answers are usually going to be too strong. Have some unknown comparisons, bring up something unmentioned, or go against something that was said in the passage. A is saying that Roman law wouldn't have had a paradox because it didn't protect free speech. That seems pretty on point, right? The paradox came from, in U.S. and Canadian law, came from the idea that, like, I'm allowed to tell the world that Eddie had an affair, and I'm allowed to ask Eddie for money, so why is it bad in combo? But in Roman law, there's no paradox because they were like, you're not allowed to tell the world that Eddie had an affair. Let's keep that. B gives us an unknown comparison. We have no idea how to compare how widely blackmail was practiced in antiquity versus now. C is too strong and offering, again, a comparison. We know that in Canadian and American law, you have one freedom that you didn't have in Roman law. You can tell the world that Eddie had an affair. But we can't say in general. If you tallied up all the freedoms, there are more in Canada and the U.S., D's got an extreme word giveaway. The best justification looks very dangerous. But this is even kind of contradicted because passage A is saying the best justification for the illegality is that you are misusing a third party's leverage. E is also making a statement that's too strong. It's saying that in Canada and the U.S., they don't even recognize that public authorities may sometimes have an interest in having certain types of info revealed. That's just taking the fact that we only talked about public authorities at the end of the Roman passage and trying to get students to think, well, if they never mentioned it in the other passage, I guess it doesn't exist. But that's way too strong an inference. So we're coming back to A. Question 17. Pause if you want to try it first. Welcome back. This question is asking us, what's something that would be true in passage A, but not true in passage B when it comes to blackmail? So do we need to research or do we already have it in us? I think we already have it in us because we do have that big central difference, right? In Canada and the U.S., you're allowed to reveal someone's shameful secret, but in Rome, you're not. So let's look for something that sounds like, you know, whether or not you're allowed to reveal someone's shameful secret. A is saying that in Canadian and U.S. law, you're combining two acts that are separately legal. Okay, right. That's kind of like the question we just answered. The whole paradox comes from the two legal things. And we just said that in Rome, there is no paradox because it wasn't legal to reveal Eddie's shameful secret. This seems to make sense. Let's keep it. 
B is saying that in Canada and U.S., there's a triangular nature. In Roman law, there is not. We know that in passage A, we talked about the triangular thing, not passage B, so maybe keep that too. C is saying something pretty extreme, that the laws are meant to be enforced precisely as written. And if we check that in passage A, it's actually contradicted. Remember, we write the statutes too broadly, counting on prosecutors not to enforce it precisely as written. So that is contradicted. D is saying that in the Canadian-US system, a blackmail victim is trying to avoid harm by someone other than the blackmailer. But that would be true in the Roman system as well. I mean, that's just what blackmail is. You're always threatening with someone else's leverage. E doesn't even make sense based on the question stem because you'd be saying that it's not true of blackmail in the Roman legal context that Canadian and US common law have no special category. It's kind of a nonsensical answer because you can't apply it to Roman. But if we were even thinking about that language of no special category, we know for sure from the first sentence of passage B that it applies to classical Roman. They did not have a special category for blackmail. So it's definitely happening in B. And probably they intended this as a reverse, where if people were thinking what's true in passage B but not true in passage A. When we revisit A and B, we might realize that the triangular structure is actually a reference to what we just got rid of in D. It's this idea that you have the blackmailer, the blackmailee, and then the person that would harm the blackmailee if the shameful secret were revealed. So blackmail always has a triangular structure. That's not different from system to system, which means that we are talking A once again is our correct answer. Here's question 18. Pause it if you'd like to give it a try. Welcome back. When we look at the question stem and think, can we anticipate this answer? Do we need to research anything? It kind of feels like we're still being tested on the exact same thing. What would have been illegal in Roman law? Telling the world that Eddie had an affair. Whereas that's not illegal in Canada and US unless you are blackmailing Eddie. So it seems like once again, it's the very big difference. And we should think the answer will sound something like whether or not it is allowable to tell someone's shameful secret. A is talking about bribing tax officials that doesn't have anything to do with revealing a secret. Get it out of here. B is talking about revealing to authorities that someone's embezzled. That's definitely revealing a secret. Let's keep that. C is talking about testifying in court, basically lying in court, saying someone's innocent when you know they're guilty. That's the opposite. That's hiding someone's secret. And then D is talking about informing the IRS that someone's concealing their true income. So yeah, you're telling someone's secret. E is talking about revealing that someone's been having an affair, which is actually my stupid Eddie example. So yes, this is also about telling someone's shameful secret. Okay, so three of these worked, huh? All about revealing a shameful secret that could harm them. We gotta check the text. What exactly is illegal in Roman law? Well, at the end of the last paragraph, it's saying, you can reveal shameful information only if it's made for a legitimate purpose and deals with a matter that the public authorities have an interest in. Okay, so in the case of B, there's definitely a public authority. It literally says it. And so that feels like, yeah, the military would really want to know that someone's stealing funds from its budget. That would be like a legitimate time to be a whistleblower. In D, you're informing a tax agency that people are cheating on their taxes. So again, that's a matter the public authorities have an interest in. But in E, you're just revealing to the public. You're not like revealing anything to a public authority. And so it's not like the government needs to know that this person had an affair. Now you're just kind of gossiping to TMZ. So E is the one that does not have like a legitimate reason for the reveal. A and C didn't have anything to do with revealing a secret. Finally, question 19. Pause the recording if you want to take a look at it. Analogy questions can be really difficult to set up in our brains. A lot of times the relationship we choose won't be quite right and we'll have to sort of like amend it as we go. I would be thinking the relationship between these two blackmail laws 
is again what we've come back to over and over again, that in Canada and the US, you are allowed to reveal someone's secret, but not when you pair it up with threatening them with money. Whereas in Rome, you just weren't allowed to reveal their secret unless you had a really good reason to. So how do we make that more generic? I would stress, I guess, that in uh, Canada and the US, you can do these two things separately, but you can't combine them. Whereas in Rome, we're just saying, no, you can't even do that first thing unless you've got a legitimate reason to do it. The relationship in A is that in Canada, US, you need a license and insurance, but in Rome, it's free willy. You can do anything you want, no requirement. That doesn't make any sense because Rome here is the less permissive society. They're saying, you can't tell the world that Eddie had an affair. B is making a distinction. You know, here it's illegal on trains, but over there it's illegal on trains and buses. So it sounds like Rome would have something that's illegal in a wider set of cases. Maybe we could make that work by saying, in passage A, free speech is only illegal when you're sort of misusing it with a third party's leverage. Whereas in Rome, it was illegal in a wider set of cases. Even if you're not misusing someone's leverage, you can't tell the world Eddie had an affair. I don't love that, but I guess we can keep it because answers on analogy frequently are surprising. The distinction in C is about like a lot of loopholes versus very few loopholes. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. A lot of loopholes to blackmail versus not, I mean, or I don't know, a lot of loopholes to free speech versus very few loopholes to free speech. That just doesn't feel like the right distinction. The distinction for D is that in one country, a very certain population can't own guns. Whereas in the other country, basically nobody can own guns. So that definitely fits where Rome, the second half, is more restrictive. We could basically say that it's illegal to combine being a felon with owning a gun, just as it's illegal to combine revealing a shameful secret with using someone else's leverage. Whereas in Rome, um, it's just illegal to reveal the shameful secret unless you have a good reason. And in answer choice D, in this second country, it's just illegal to own a gun unless you have a good reason, like unless you're the police or the military. So that one seems to work pretty well. Let's keep that. E is sort of like A, where the second country is more permissive, which is not what we want. In the US and Canada, they're saying something is just illegal on any roads. And in the second country, they're saying, well, it's legal, but we have extra special penalties. And that doesn't match anything. We never spoke about Rome having harsher penalties for certain blackmailers. When we revisit B, we're talking about what's illegal in each country. And when we think about blackmail, what was illegal in Rome was just saying, you're not allowed to share someone's secret unless you got a good reason. That's not the same as like a wider set of cases, both trains and trains and buses. We're really forcing that relationship to work. Whereas D is a little bit more comfortable. It's just saying, yeah, just guns aren't legal unless you like have a special reason like the cops or the military. Whereas in the first country, like Canada and the US, we're saying guns or free speech is legal unless you combine it with this other thing, with being a felon or unless you combine free speech with misusing a third party's leverage. So D ultimately has more similarities we can match up. Before we read either passage, we scanned through the questions to see if any of them were asking just about passage A or just about passage B, so that we could prioritize reading that one first. Then we went and actually worked on some questions. We got a correct answer to the one that was just asking about A, and we tried making some eliminations on questions that we're asking which of these is true from each passage. Then when we read the second passage, we thought a lot about how they relate, like sentence by sentence. We were trying to make connections back to the other passage. We were even pausing to look stuff up in the first passage to be clearer about how they relate. And then we went and finished the questions. And as we saw here, sometimes the relationship is so central to the questions you know, four of the six questions were just testing our ability to understand that in the US, free speech is legal. In Rome, free speech was not necessarily legal. All right, that's it for this passage. 
Check out some of our other videos on YouTube or visit us at lsatlab.com.